This is Office Hours at Duke University. Professor Deborah Jensen, like many of us, was moved by the images she saw from the January 12 earthquake in Haiti. A scholar of language and literature, Jensen responded by developing a course in Haitian Creole for Americans headed to Haiti to do relief work. She also continues her study of Haiti's literary past and says the country's history provides clues for its recovery. Everyone watching is invited to ask Professor Jensen a question. To do that, send an email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. Here at Duke, Professor Jensen has appointments in French studies and romance studies. She developed the course Haitian Creole for the Haitian Recovery with the accompanying Duke Creole blog. Her forthcoming book is Beyond the Slave Narrative, Politics, Sex, and Manuscripts in the Haitian Revolution, and she is a presenter at an ongoing conference here at Duke on Haiti's history, Foundations for the Future. I'm James Todd with Duke's News Office, and Professor Jensen, we are here at your online office hours. So you're kind enough to take your lunch break from this Haiti's <laughs> History Conference to come here and share with us and our viewers uh, about what's going on. So what are some of the themes you're talking with colleagues from Haiti, from Jamaica, and of course from the U.S. about Haiti's past and future? What, uh, what themes are coming up? Well, we began discussing um, the, the independence period in Haiti's history. There were two papers on Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who was the first leader of Haiti as an independent nation between 1804 and 1806. We discussed his legacies. Then we moved on to a longer history of, of Haiti's literature. And in the afternoon yesterday, we had presentations on uh, the American occupation of Haiti in the beginning of the 20th century and on voodoo and the way that uh, people have interpreted voodoo, uh, voodoo either positively or negatively in terms of Haiti's development. And today we're focusing primarily on the protection and restoration of Haiti's archives and libraries. So your paper was on Jean-Jacques Dessalines, uh, mm -hmm. something of a George Washington figure, a founding That's father right. for Haiti. So for, for people new to Haiti's history, how would you introduce Jean-Jacques Dessalines? Well, Dessalines was, was born a slave in Haiti, and he became a general in the Haitian army uh, when, it was, when it was basically the French army in Saint-Domingue. And uh, then he became the first uh, uh, leader. And he has, has long been known as a very fierce and bloodthirsty kind of leader. But um, I have been extremely interested in the textual legacies that he left behind in the form of these independence proclamations that he carefully had published throughout the Western world, throughout the U.S. and in Europe. And I think that his proclamations, even though he produced them with secretaries, really uh, are, are worth considering as, as a foundational Afro-American or Afro-diasporic uh, voice, um, along with people like Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, Frantz Fanon. Uh, I think that he's philosophically and politically a fascinating figure. And uh, here at Duke, we are, are, this is really one of the places where he is being taken most seriously. And uh, he is a tremendous hero for Haitians, uh, but he has not really been studied as much as one might expect in academic uh, environments, partly because he was known not to have formal schooling, and people long assumed that his proclamations were not really his. And I have contested that and said that they really are his, that mm -hmm. even though these are texts that he composed with various different secretaries, that we can see the hallmarks of his style, his way of thinking, the rhetoric that he used in all of these documents. And your paper particularly focuses on his interactions and relations with, with America, with the U.S. That's right. That uh, has, of course, set in motion those relations ever since. So how would you care? I mean, they're complex. How, how would you uh, sketch those? Right. Well, the, the, the former slaves of Haiti overthrew the armies of Napoleon Bonaparte, mm -hmm. so just an extraordinary uh, extraordinary reversal of a hegemonic power um, in, in the Western world. And Dessalines initially uh, was, was very clear on the, the resources, the riches that he had at his disposal because Haiti had been the richest colony in the world. Okay. Um, in the 18th century, there was no other colony that rivaled uh, what was called Saint-Domingue at the time for its riches. It was known as the Pearl of the Antilles. 
And so Dessalines uh, accurately uh, foresaw that he had a great deal to offer, places like Jamaica, which was a British colony, or the U.S. And in the U.S., although uh, there were many racist reactions against uh, the presence of this former slave as a new national leader, there was also huge interest in economic opportunities for um, c commerce with Haiti. And Congress uh, was, was extremely interested in all of the delicate logistics of making Haiti a major trading partner for the U.S. Uh, and so one finds all kinds of government records, of public editorials and newspapers, that show that people took very seriously that Jean-Jacques Dessalines could be as legitimate a leader as Napoleon Bonaparte. They were both emperors after the first few months, and people said, why shouldn't we trade with a black emperor as much as with a white emperor? And only gradually, and for very complex reasons, did that relationship fall apart. It had partly to do with the ongoing pressure exerted by France France wanted the rest of, of the major European and uh, nations and the U.S. to believe that it was still at war with Haiti and that the law of nations prevented all other countries from engaging in direct commerce with Haiti. And um, in the U.S., many people said, no, you're not still at war with Haiti. Haiti won the war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Haiti is now a sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but over time, people became um, very anxious that if they went against the interests of France, if they really supported um, a black nation of former slaves, that they were undermining the slave system in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And anxiety about that uh, slowly rose um, to the forefront uh, through a variety of complex adventures that included um, uh, an attempt to emancipate some of the Spanish colonies of the mm. New World that went through Haiti and that brought great discredit on Jefferson and Madison. Mm. And so it's, it's too complex to explain here, but basically by 1806, Haiti was being profoundly marginalized with trade embargoes. Mm -hmm. The U.S. did not recognize Haiti's independence until 1862 under Lincoln. Mm. And, uh, and Haiti, uh, uh, by 1825, had negotiated an, a huge indemnity payment to France mm -hmm. of the equivalent of $21 billion in today's terms, which they repaid over the course of the 19th century. And so, so Haiti faced an extremely difficult future after a very promising early moment. Very good. And Professor Jensen, we are taking questions from our online viewers. Yes. You can send Professor Jensen a question by email, live at duke.edu. You can tweet in your question with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. We've got a question that's been relayed by email that comes from Manushka in Seat de Soleil in Port-au-Prince. It's in Creole, so uh, we're going to need you to both read it translate it, and then respond. Sure, and I really hope that Manushka in mm -hmm. Cité Soleil is watching this. Cité Soleil, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is a very uh, underprivileged neighborhood in, in Port-au-Prince. Um, it's often known as, as a ghetto. Um, it has a very large population of hundreds of thousands of people who live generally in fairly rudimentary shelters. And it's a very vibrant and lively cultural community mm -hmm. filled with fascinating people. And this question is quite remarkable. Uh, Manushka writes, Condition Haiti jodia, c'est un gros want pour papa Dessaline, parce que c'est pour gens nap vive la lite goumé. C'est want parce que lite goumé pour nous pat gain yon l'état reste avec. Yon l'état qui pas met li même, qui pas capable gérer li même. Captain, c'est l'autre pays qui pouvin aider elle. Okay, so Manushka writes, the condition of Haiti today is, is an enormous source of shame for Papa Dessalines, this is mm -hmm. the leader, Jean-Jacques Jean Dessalines, Dessalines okay. uh, because it, it was not for this way of, us, of, our, of our lifestyle today that he fought. Uh, it is a great shame because he fought for us not to have 
a rest of X state, and I'm going to explain this idea of a rest of X state. Okay. She says, a state that is not a master of itself, that is not capable of managing its own interests, mm -hmm. a state that is waiting for other countries to come and help it. And she's absolutely right. Papa Dessalines did fight for the autonomy of mm -hmm. Haiti. Papa Dessalines was always unwilling to negotiate with other countries on any kind of a subordinate basis. Okay. He wanted full recognition of Haiti's independence, and he was a fighter. She uses the, this verb, goumé, to fight. Mm -hmm. And the expression restavec is really fascinating mm -hmm. because uh, restavec comes from the French verb rester and, and the preposition avec, to stay with, mm -hmm. and it is a term for children who are somewhere on a continuum between foster children and domestic workers mm -hmm. in other people's households hmm. in Haiti. They're sometimes orphans, mm -hmm. sometimes simply children in impoverished families, mm -hmm. or children from rural uh, families who have relatives in the mm -hmm. city. Some people consider Restavex to be child slaves. Mm. Um, I actually don't agree with that designation. I think that it's something that makes Haiti very vulnerable to outside interventions of the intrusive paternalism kind. Mm -hmm. But so she is saying here, that Haiti is like mm -hmm. those children uh, who work in someone else's house. She's saying that Haiti is is a rest avec in the sense that it is always uh, dealing with a government that is partly a government from outside. Mm -hmm. um, it has a state uh, that is that is quite weak. Uh, the role of NGOs, mm -hmm. the role of international governments, is oblique and hard for Haitians themselves to navigate. Mm -hmm. So to Manushka, I would say um, that it's because of the kind of historical consciousness uh, that people like Manushka have mm -hmm. that Haiti's future is always bright, including mm -hmm. in fairly blighted areas like Cité mm -hmm. Soleil, because you see the intelligence of this question, mm -hmm. you see the historical consciousness, and Manushka, this is a moment in which we all uh, need to be very vigilant that recovery efforts can't be a kind of seizing of initiative from Haiti. Mm -hmm. It always has to be truly dialogue. Mm -hmm. And Creole, working with people in their own language, mm -hmm. is absolutely key mm -hmm. in that. If we go in speaking only French or only English, mm -hmm. we miss the opportunity to dialogue with the great majority of the Haitian population, which is Creole speaking only. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and it is precisely a knowledge of their country, their heroes, their sense mm -hmm. of their independence, their sense of a kind of wounded independence mm -hmm. that we need to be aware of. And in a way, you've been addressing this with this course you developed, Haitian Creole for the Haitian Recovery. Yeah. So you're teaching not only Creole language, how to ask for the bathroom, I, I'm guessing, right. sort of practical <laughs> things, but some That's of right. the, the cultural knowledge. So, and, and there's many, many Americans, of course, with good intentions. So what's, what's the knowledge you're, tra you're trying to transmit about a posture someone either from here or going to Haiti might have. Exactly. Yes, we, we are trying to make people aware of the fact that uh, on a certain level, we are all trying to help ourselves when mm -hmm. we help others. We are trying to, uh, to learn how we can be most valuable in our role in a greater world. And this is something that really has to be balanced uh, with Haitians' uh, desires to help themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we look at orientation, we look at um, ways of really privileging Haitians uh, in these humanitarian interactions. Mm -hmm. And that includes things like, as you set up your own cell phone, that you need to be aware that you may need to do topping up of the minutes on Haitian cell phones uh -huh. so that you can uh -huh. continue to dialogue with them even if their, their money for their minutes runs out. Uh, we, we talk about how to, uh, how to navigate um, the, the, the larger scenario of the cities that were so badly hit by the earthquake, mm -hmm. which are not only Port-au-Prince, but also Léogan, Le 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 mm -hmm. uh, Tiguave, and Jacmel, uh, and the suburbs of uh, Carrefour and Quai des Bouquets also. And uh, so we also try to think about what is NGO culture? There is no place in the world that has more NGOs than Haiti. Mm. And it is on the one hand a sign of people's unbelievable goodwill, unbelievable mm. willingness to involve themselves in, in making Haiti a stronger place. On the other hand, 
any place where you have a fragmented map mm -hmm. of outside interventions uh, with people setting up a generator here, mm -hmm. a well there, a private mm -hmm. school there, can be a place that becomes difficult for a state to mm -hmm. set up larger initiatives in. So thinking about how NGOs work is very important and learning what those NGOs are and uh, how they are all arguing amongst themselves. We mm -hmm. try to give people a little literacy in mm -hmm. this. Okay, we've got a, a follow-up question around yes. this question of sovereignty. Uh, it comes from Gaspard. Ah. And uh, <laughs> he says, by email, I attended the conference yesterday. I heard a lot of beautiful words being spoken. That's fine for all the intellects in the room. <laughs> However, Haiti is full of intellects who too whom too often love to hear themselves speaking big, expansive <laughs> words, but never really care about the people who inspire them to write those words. My question is, not having a competent government to enforce the rules, how do you reach the actual individual in dire need of help for a better life? How do you get that message to them? Okay, uh, fascinating question, Gaspard. Um, uh, I actually have never met the mythical uh, uh, Haitian who doesn't care about the people of Haiti, and and yet it, it's an eternal point of reference. And yesterday, one thing that the writer Lionel Trio said is that everything is comparative. In other words, in Haiti, you have such a large mass of utterly unprivileged people that by contrast, people who have higher education, people who have any kind of employment, people who write for a living, mm -hmm. uh, are all become the elite. And you end up with this tremendous political tension between them. And, uh, and this is a tension that the elite themselves are continually drawing attention to. They're mm -hmm. continually saying, we're not reaching the larger mm -hmm. Haitian majority. Mm -hmm. And so, and for instance, um, former ambassador Jean Casimir, who's been here as a Mellon professor this semester, mm -hmm. and who just gave us a lecture in, in Creole last week, he says, how can we create a new in Haiti, a we in Haiti? Mm -hmm. And part of that issue is again Creole. It mm -hmm. is partly a question, and Gaspard, uh, if this is the Gaspard that I know, mm -hmm. um, has been a Creole teacher here mm -hmm. and highly valued. Mm -hmm. And uh, but um, so, so Professor Casimir wrote a book that is a history of Haiti that is um, partly Creole and partly French. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to bring people together in the same way that we're bringing people together like Manushka in this kind of a discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, Haiti's educational system needs to have Creole tracks because mm -hmm. you may not know this, but in Haiti, paradoxically enough, almost all education is in French. French okay. Even though only a small minority speaks French, mm -hmm. you can imagine what a detour educationally mm -hmm. it is to do it all in a foreign language mm -hmm. and a language that your family isn't speaking, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so education needs to become more creolophone. The state undoubtedly needs to be uh, given a little more strength, a little more autonomy, mm -hmm. so that it can reach out to a large, large public. Mm -hmm. And uh, But on this, this question of whether there is bad faith, well, you hear about it. I personally have not seen that. I've mm -hmm. seen instead people from a range of political positions all quite agonized by Haiti's problems mm -hmm. and all wanting uh, to help. And so I tend to think that Haitians are actually extraordinarily engaged in trying to improve the situation, but it is a complex one. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got some more questions that have come sure. in. And everybody watching is invited to ask Professor Jensen a question. To do that, send it to live at duke.edu. You can tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. This one comes in from Laura, and it's a little bit complex question. Uh, Laura living in Port-au-Prince, and it picks up on this connection of elites and history, and she says, in the book Silencing the Past, Michel Rolf Trouillot writes, since the early 19th century, the Haitian elites have chosen to respond to racist denigration with an epic discourse lauding their revolution. The epic of 1791-1804 nurtures among them a positive image of blackness quite useful in a white-dominated world. But the epic is equally useful on the home front. It is one of the rare historical alibis of these elites, an indispensable reference to their claims of power. In what ways might Haitian history, or motivated and mythologized rememberings of that history, be a liability rather than a source of strength post-January 12, the earthquake? 
Okay, fascinating question. And this there. Laura, uh, who is in, in Port-au-Prince, this mm -hmm. is Laura Wagner, who mm -hmm. was one of the Creole teachers in the, uh, uh, the Haitian Creole for the Recovery course. Mm -hmm. Laura had been doing field work in Haiti at the time of the earthquake. Mm -hmm. She was trapped in the rubble of her oh. landlady's building and uh, uh, evacuated to the U.S. She returned here, and we had uh, the extraordinary gift of, of her presence in the classroom and her anthropological perspectives. And uh, uh, Laura's question, which is basically saying, um, is the Haitian Revolution not only an extraordinary source of pride, but also something that distances us from Haiti's current realities mm -hmm. is very important because, in effect, uh, this this continual reference back to Dessalines, to Toussaint Louverture, to being the first black nation, mm -hmm. the only successful slave revolution in the world, can, of course, provide a kind of alibi even for people who are not at all politically engaged, mm -hmm. who are not trying to extend democracy to a larger sphere to sort of make it something that is assumed and implicit in, in their structures. And I think that Laura is saying, how can we see contemporary revolutions, mm -hmm. not of a bloody sort, but revolutions in the, sen of, in the sense of the extension of rights, the mm -hmm. extension of inf infrastructure to the people who need it, people in Cité Soleil, people in the provinces. Uh, how can we extend uh, higher education from the capital and Cap Haitien uh, to the smaller cities in Haiti so mm -hmm. that you don't have to go uh, to the capital and live a certain kind of life in order to participate mm -hmm. in higher education? And these are just infrastructural questions also. Um, how can there be clean water throughout the country? How can people get the vaccinations that they need? Um, I have been uh, uh, working with some people in Tiguav um, to try to figure out how they can prevent themselves from continuing to get typhoid mm -hmm. from the conditions in the, in the camps that they are living in, where you know it's the rainy season, there's mud everywhere, there are people everywhere, Hygiene, despite you know the extraordinary measures they take to maintain cleanliness, is not adequate, and people get these diseases mm -hmm. that are from another century. Mm -hmm. And so, so how do we address these questions? So I think that Laura is saying that, you know, even as uh, we understand Haiti in part through the lens of this extraordinary moment of revolutionary history, we also need to find. Um, that, that moment of the crystallization of responsibility mm -hmm. in Haiti's contemporary identity. Um, and how can that responsibility be communicated to the citizens of Haiti? Yeah. Good, and, and we've got another question that's right along these lines. It comes from Niels by email. And he says, history matters in Haiti's revolution. Uh, origins clearly helped determine that country's path. Still, it occurred more than 200 years ago. <laughs> Isn't it a bit convenient to trace the country's current problems, which are so massive, to events that occurred so long ago? After all, we don't blame George Washington for the 9-11 attacks. <laughs> so 200 okay. years, what, what's happened since? Okay, I would say yes and no. I do actually think that some structures were immediately set up at the time of the independence, and mm -hmm. those structures have to do partly with the refusal of a larger international community mm -hmm. to truly take Haiti's sovereignty seriously, to mm -hmm. say yes, we will deal with you diplomatically. We will trade with you. We will respect your international rights mm -hmm. in the law of nations and other, other uh, globalized constructs. Um, one way to look at the influence of the revolution is that Dessalines right away made sure that no French people could ever hold property uh, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. No foreigners could be property holders. Hmm. Um, no one could own slaves uh, in Haiti, obviously, because slavery had been abolished. But this also extended to not allowing the uh, mixed-race children of former slaveholders to own property in hmm. Haiti. It was the state that owned that property. And this, in a sense, set up a very murky 
um, property rights mm -hmm. in Haiti. And to this day, property rights in Haiti uh, are legally very obscure. Mm -hmm. And this continues to have a tremendous impact mm -hmm. on the current moment. Um, many people believe that if you're not actually living uh, you know, on a parcel of land, if you're not farming the land, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you own it. It's essentially mm -hmm. not yours. And uh, when the larger international uh, community comes in and tries mm -hmm. to work with Haiti, there's often no awareness of these kinds of historical structures mm -hmm. and the unique challenges that they pose. Um, but yes, I do think also that, that Niels is right and that uh, just, just like Laura, that in the, the current moment, we do need to understand in great detail, how does the state function and not function? Mm -hmm. um, how do we need to understand, even if we disapprove of a larger coalition of governments mm -hmm. uh, from outside of Haiti, how do we nevertheless need to understand how it functions? Mm -hmm. What kinds of transparency and accountability systems need to be set up, not only with regard to Haitian spending aid dollars, but with regard to pledges, uh, mm -hmm. which in the majority are never actually dispersed in Haiti, mm -hmm. which is something that people don't tend to take account of. There's mm -hmm. a whole discourse of corruption in Haiti, but that corruption is sometimes partly a failure to deliver from outside. Hmm. Okay, and, and speaking of uh, delivering assistance, we've got another question. This one comes by Twitter, and everyone watching can ask Professor Jensen a question. To do that, send an email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet in your question with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. Uh, this one's from Twitter from Prayer Chapel, and it asks, are you aware of an association of Haitian faith-based groups providing assistance? So, Of, of Haitian faith-based? It says Haitian faith-based, uh, and you can speak more broadly to, to the role of... Uh, uh, I guess, uh, Christian groups sure, in sure. the country. Sure, mm sure. -hmm. I am actually not aware of, of a Haitian coalition of faith-based mm -hmm. groups. We are very aware of the importance of faith-based groups and their initiatives in Haiti. And mm -hmm. the Haiti Lab at Duke, which is um, uh, starting in the fall, it's at the Franklin Humanities mm -hmm. Institute, Laurent Dubois and I will be co-directing it, has mm -hmm. as a core faculty member, Kathy Walmer, who is the executive director of Family Health Ministries and also uh, an adjunct faculty member in global health. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kathy will be helping us to deal with, with the range of local and less local uh, religious organizations who are doing all kinds of very important initiatives mm -hmm. in Haiti. And this has already started to have an impact on, on our teaching in interesting ways. Um, University Presbyterian Church in Chapel Hill just last week sent me photos of all of these little notes that Haitian teachers had written when they were in Haiti recently, when the church was in Haiti recently doing teacher workshops to help teachers do a sort of self-esteem curriculum mm -hmm. with handicapped children mm -hmm. in Haiti. And it was about what part of your body uh, are you most at ease with? What do you love about your body? Mm -hmm. And so we had all these little notes and we sent them to the students in mm -hmm. Haitian Creole for the recovery and they did translations of these notes. Mm -hmm. And they really loved trying to decipher people's handwriting, the mm -hmm. ways that people wrote their names with the last name first, mm -hmm. then, the, mm -hmm. then the first name, and, and the, these unique little stories. And so we are very interested in just taking account of, of all of, of the different ways that Americans mm -hmm. are involved in Haiti and, and making sure in the Haiti lab uh, that we can uh, represent um, a, a real cross-section uh, cross of, mm -hmm. of these initiatives. Good. Now, Professor Jensen, when we talk about uh, Haiti's history, we would be remiss if we didn't mention a recent major archival discovery and you know what I'm talking about when yes. your graduate students, Julia Gaffield, was in uh, the United Kingdom National Archives and came upon some correspondence uh, from a, a Jamaican ambassador, a ambassador in Jamaica, and found what's believed to be the only known printed official Haitian okay. direct declaration of independence. So we've got a question tied to this, but we also, we've got an interview clip uh, from Ms. Gaffield talking about this. So let's listen to uh, Duke's Julia Gaffield talking about this moment of discovery. 1804 was, was a huge year for, for Haiti in 
the Jamaican archives. Um, and so this was a binder that had a lot of information. And I, I came across a cover letter that said, um, you know, attached is this, this information I've received from Edward Corbett, who, who was the, the British agent sent to Haiti. Um, and, and all of these other documents for your information. And there was a big package of them. Um, and then I read the cover letter from Edward Corbett, and I had seen this one before in Jamaica. And it had the, a paragraph that said, enclosed is this document that you might find of interest or, or something like that. Um, it is not but two hours from the press. And so in my mind, I was like, yes, I've seen this before. And, um, and one of my advisors, Deborah Jensen, and I had spoken about the, the meaning of the word press. And so uh, we, were, we were hoping that um, the original was going to be there. And so I flipped a couple more pages. There, was, there were other things in the mix. Um, and among other printed documents was the Declaration of Independence. Um, and for, it's, it's kind of a, an awkward moment to, to find something so exciting because it's a quiet room. It's a reading room. Um, you're not allowed to talk, and, and I don't know anyone there. So um, I just had to, you know, take, take photographs and then continue, continue my research, but bottle, bottle all of this excitement until I could, until I could go home and, and email. So it was, it was extremely exciting, but at the same time, I had to kind of contain it all. <laughs> so that's Duke's Julia Gaffield talking about her great discovery, a printed copy of Haiti's Declaration of Independence. And we can actually show viewers of the first couple pages of that, what it looks like. And here's a question that's come in about that. It comes from Jack by email, one of your graduate students that covered, discovered Haiti's Declaration of Independence recently. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. She said you were the first person she emailed after finding this document in the National Archives in London. What was your reaction? <laughs> All right. I remember her, her email came uh, on February 2nd. And... I, I was staggered to hear that she had found something printed by the Haitian government because uh, I myself had been researching this document for a long time and had never found anything that was so concrete that gave us a specific way to sort of really understand this document when it had been uh, printed and so on. At the same time, we were so caught up in the earthquake. Uh, we were teaching the recovery course. I was, you know, on the phone every day with, with contacts in Haiti. Um, Laurent and I were planning this conference on the archives, trying to conceptualize uh, with a large community how Haiti's um, patrimony uh, can, can be protected. And so I was fascinated, and at the same time, it was sort of like, okay, back to the, the debris, kind of back to the, the current uh, moment. And so there was a delayed reaction for me in really understanding um, uh, the way that Julia's discovery would also bring together uh, Haitian Americans and Haitians um, uh, from, and, and also Canadian, uh, Haitian Canadians in enjoying this document and really understanding Desalines' originality and his fierce and energetic, uh, extraordinary galvanization of, of the new nation of Haiti. Good. Well, let's take a look at the document itself, yes. Haiti's Declaration of Independence. Uh, Liberté ou la mort at the top there, <laughs> uh, I guess freedom or death. And right. so, so what's the significance of this document? Obviously, it's something of a living document like our own Declaration of Independence. What, That's right. What, what language really jumps out now and for Haiti today. Sure. Well, liberty or death obviously uh, refers back to the American Revolution mm -hmm. and shows the profound influence of, of American revolutionary structures in Haiti. Uh, we see that this is um, the Armée Indigène, the indigenous army. Mm -hmm. Of course, the former slaves were not indigenous. Um, many of them had come directly from Africa, and others uh, had been there for a generation or two, but that, that was, was, but they were not indigenous. Indigenous, but they were connecting their identity to the whole history before Columbus arrived at the island of Hispaniola in 1492 hmm. um, to the Taino uh, Amerindian cultures. And um, the Taino Indians had suffered near genocide um, in, in the first half century mm -hmm. of European colonization. And so the Haitian army 
identified with this legacy of a long colonization, mm -hmm. the long abuse of, of different populations for the sake of the European economic motor, hmm. um, uh, first in, in mercantile uh, economies and then segging into capitalist economies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is a document in which Desalines, well, it has three parts. The first part is where um, uh, Desalines speaks to the generals. They take an oath to live free or die. The second part is a long speech in which Desalines addresses the people of Haiti. And he is raising their morale. He is saying, stay on your guard against attempts to recolonize the country, mm -hmm. which was very prescient. <laughs> Indeed, there, mm -hmm. you know, in France, people were really trying to think through how can we recolonize mm -hmm. Saint-Domingue. And he has so many fascinating turns of phrase in this document. He says at one point, we dared to be free where we were not free. Uh, he, he um, uh, in another document, refers to them having been the authors of their own liberty, mm -hmm. which no one wanted to grant them. He calls the French uh, those who have been enslaved by their own practices of enslaving. Hmm. He says, now, let's... Let's, let's turn the epithet of the slave mm -hmm. back to the French who have conquered so much that they have ended up being conquered by it. Hmm. So for Desalines, the slave is not a static category in any kind of a natural relationship to Africans. Mm -hmm. Slavery for him is some kind of subjugation that can come precisely through the power that you wield mm -hmm. and the corruption of, mm -hmm. of the power that you wield. Hmm. Um, Desalines also says that the, the, the manners and traces of French colonialism are imprinted everywhere in Haiti. And how can they throw off these legacies? How can, can their cities, their culture, their practices not continue to be uh, basically neo-colonial? Of course, he didn't use that word, mm -hmm. but he anticipates the whole problem. Mm -hmm. It has been a major problem in Haiti. Mm -hmm. There's uh, some other words that are at the heart of Haiti's inception as a nation, this uh, oath that came in woods. Yes. And um, this has actually come up in, in the recent uh, discourse about Haiti once again. Am I right that Pat Robertson is, yes. is referring to this? Pact so, with the devil, yes. Uh, yeah, so, so let's, if you wouldn't mind, hear the original Creole. Sure. And then tell us what it's saying, what it means. Sure. In, and give in, us some context. Yeah, yes. Set it up for us. In 1791, mm -hmm. uh, the, the slave insurrection that launched the Haitian Revolution uh, began with this moment where um, representatives of the slaves from many different uh, plantations got together with uh, a voodoo priest named Bukman mm -hmm. uh, and also with uh, a woman uh, priestess. And they took an oath that is a fascinating description of these uh, slaves and former slaves' attempts to differentiate their own world vision from that of their colonizers. So I will quickly read it. Bon Dieu qui fait soleil, qui claire et nous en haut, qui soulève la mer, qui fait gronder l'orage, bon Dieu là, zotende, caché non yon nuage, et là li gade nous, li we tout ça blanc fait. Bon Dieu blanc, mon dieu crime, et pas de nouvelle bien fait, mais Dieu là, qui si bon, ordonne nous vengeance, li va conduit bras nous, li ba nous assistance, jete potre die blanc qui soif de l'eau nan genou, coûte la liberté, li pale que nous tous. God who makes the sun, who lights us up from above, who raises up the seas, who makes the storms growl, God is there, you hear? hidden in a cloud, and there he watches us. He sees everything the whites do. The God of the whites orders crime. He wants nothing good for us, but the God there who is so good orders us to take vengeance. He will guide our arms. He will give us assistance. Throw down the portrait of the God of the whites who thirsts for the tears in our eyes. Listen to liberty. It speaks in all of our hearts. Mm. Now, in this oath, which was first transcribed uh, by the Haitian writer uh, Erard Dumel in 1824, um, and which is written in, in a classic poetic form, which it probably didn't have at the time, mm -hmm. but which we believe is pretty close to the mm -hmm. original, 
In it, we see in the beginning just one God, mm -hmm. and slowly that God splits. And you have the God who is there, who is hidden in a cloud, the God who sees what the whites do. And then you have the God of the whites who has been complicit with slavery, complicit mm -hmm. with colonialism. And in the end, the, the slaves are saying, um, the portrait of the God of the whites thirsts for the water in our eyes. Um, but it's liberty that speaks in all of our hearts. It's a very powerful oath. And um, interestingly, in Haiti, there is a certain religious divide over just the meaning of, of mm -hmm. the many disasters that have beset Haitian mm -hmm. history. And some Protestant groups in particular have tended to see in the oath and in the repeated disasters that have beset Haiti some kind of, of a negative legacy on a, on a sort of metaphysical order. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can see in this kind of oath um, the, the galvanizing of the slaves, making sense, creating a worldview that allows them to really seize the initiative to go out there and to emancipate themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the voodoo tradition has been um, an extraordinarily culturally rich tradition. Unfortunately, recently, there have been a lot of interpretations of voodoo as some kind of culpable or impoverishing tradition in Haiti. And I think that that is, is, is just so untrue, so unfair. Um, voodoo has been at the heart of Haitian medical practices since the era of slavery. Uh, voodoo is a powerful element of social um, connectedness and continuity. Uh, and voodoo is a musical tradition, a poetic tradition. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's in voodoo that we have some of the most important Creole texts mm -hmm. um, in the Haitian tradition. And now something that you wrote about in an essay in terms of themes, literary themes that come up about Haiti, is there are, are words like revolution and liberty mm -hmm. that, that often get used with Haiti, but also disaster That's right. and catastrophe. So what, there's obviously some tension there. Yes, absolutely, because in the beginning of the Haitian Revolution, people began writing texts about this event that were almost always labeled things like history of the disasters of Saint-Domingue hmm. or the catastrophe of Saint-Domingue. And in effect, I argue that initially what we think of as the Haitian Revolution was really understood as the disasters of Haiti. Hmm. And why was it a disaster? Mm -hmm. It was a disaster for Western hegemony. It mm -hmm. was a disaster for a Western power that was on the one hand theorizing universal human rights, that was on the one hand theorizing a general humanist continuity mm -hmm. in, uh, across the globe, and that on the other hand was incapable of seeing slaves as being part mm -hmm. of, of, of that uh, community of human rights. And it was in Haiti that, and, and also in, in Guadeloupe and other parts of the Caribbean that in effect, human rights were held to the mandate mm -hmm. of a larger human group. Mm -hmm. And um, so the French Revolution ended up being profoundly influenced by the rights that Haitians and other slaves and former slaves in the, in the Caribbean claimed for themselves. Hmm, interesting. We're, we're well into the office hour here, uh, but we've got another question, so I want to make yes. sure that we, we get to that. And it comes from Stuart. And he says, Raymond Joseph, Haiti's ambassador to the U.S., complained recently that Haiti has become a republic of NGOs. Should foreign nations and non-governmental organizations play such a heavy role in its development? But alternatively, can the government of Haiti be trusted to oversee relief funds? Well, Stuart, that <laughs> that's the question. Yeah, that's the tension. Um, uh, you know, many uh, uh, writers uh, about the current situation in Haiti believe that NGOs truly are a problem as well as the solution. Hmm. Um, I personally find myself drawn into the same situation hmm. in the sense that, uh, you know, I really believe that these need to be centralized structures, that the state needs to be privileged. But when you see people sick, dying, hmm you feel uh, compelled to respond. Mm -hmm. So there is that sort of individual or community um, need to respond, the kind of thing that, that, that philosophers like Levinas have theorized, that, that we uh, are, are 
interpolated by the suffering of others, we, we must respond. And NGOs are about that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, imagine in the U.S. if instead of having electricity grids, instead of having a taxation system mm -hmm. that allowed us to have public schools, public curricula, mm -hmm. um, imagine if it all was left up to the initiative of certain gifted individuals, but you might have a successful school in one community and no successful schools in 30 communities mm -hmm. around it. Mm -hmm. um, in effect, any uh, any country is is very vulnerable if mm -hmm. it doesn't have state infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We're in a moment in the U.S. of tremendous tension mm -hmm. um, about the role that government should have, and Haiti is a good example of mm -hmm. what happens when the role of government is minimized to the point mm -hmm. that you don't have these continuous structures, mm -hmm. you don't have public education, you don't have public utilities. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's an example for us all to think about. Um, hopefully this is a moment where NGOs will be brought together into a larger community that will itself be coordinating with the Haitian government mm -hmm. and be held responsible for sort of showing results, mm -hmm. for attempting to truly network and extend the sphere of their work. And that will involve for people needing to give up a part of their own initiative mm -hmm. in order to make uh, an initiative that is sort of closer to the base of the pyramid mm -hmm. be the one that works, something that will cover more ground. Mm -hmm. And it's always hard for us to give up our little territorial mm -hmm. interests, but in Haiti right now, everybody has to give up territorialism and work toward larger projects whenever possible. Great. Well, Professor Jensen, thank you for taking time away from your conference to come in uh, and have this conversation. I want to wrap up with a uh, quote here, something that you wrote, and uh, see what you can expand upon here. You said uh, in a recent essay, we need to repeat and repeat to ourselves something simple, that Haiti, dear Haiti, no matter how tested and remapped by disaster, is not in itself disaster. Haiti is not disaster. So if, if that's not the right word, an all-encompassing word for Haiti disaster, what's the alternative narrative? What's the other word? What's, what else is our option? The, the other word is just to think of, of Haiti as, as just an extraordinarily accomplished nation that has mm -hmm. always been a beacon of interest for the African diaspora mm -hmm. throughout the New World. Uh, Haiti set the, the, the bar for other post-colonial uh, international relationships, uh, set the bar for articulations of sovereignty from the position of former slaves who had been in a situation of social death, as Orlando Patterson said. Um, Haiti is people like Manushka in Cité Soleil, mm -hmm. uh, who can mobilize these, these wonderful historical arguments, um, put it together with the language of, of current problems like the reste avec, to think about Haitian autonomy. Mm -hmm. Haiti is, is a brilliant and compelling uh, nation. Uh, that deserves our, our attention and involvement. Well, great. Everyone watching can follow Professor Jensen's work on the Duke Haiti website. That's duke.edu slash Haiti. There are links to the, to the Duke Creole blog, uh, Professor Jensen's courses there, the Haiti History Conference. A recording of this office hour session will be on the Duke On Demand website. That is ondemand.duke.edu. You can also find there a list of upcoming Duke webcasts including the Center for Instructional Technology Showcase next Friday and the next office hour session with Professor Bruce Lawrence on teaching Islam. To learn more about Duke, visit duke.edu.